Welcome back to another episode of the Young Guides Podcast. I'm Keaton, and this is... I'm Kyle. But first, we're going to bring a word from our partners. First up, we got Heather's Choice. Normally, we'd be telling you guys about our code that you can use on the website, the Young Guides 15, which if you want to, you can. But right now, we have a 30% off site-wide sale to get rid of our old product as we're introducing new product into the lineup here very soon. So we got to get rid of all of our inventory so we can restock and get you guys new recipes, changes to our old recipes, some new flavors you haven't seen. So if you use the code clear the shelves 30 at checkout, you can get yourself 30% off. There are some flavors we're completely getting rid of. And again, some that we're bringing to you brand new. And since I work at Heather's Choice, I've had a direct part in our research and development process and bringing you guys these new flavors and I won't spill the beans exactly yet on what we're bringing you, but I know you guys are going to love it. I cooked a bunch of it today. I smell like it. I smell good. And I'm ready to tell you guys all about it. Once it's released, Keith and I are going to hop on here and we're going to talk to you about those new recipes. So clear the shelves 30 at heatherschoice.com. Get yourself 30% off at checkout. Keaton, back to you. That is exciting news, Kyle. I think I'm going to have to take advantage of that. Heck yeah. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have Lucky Bug Lures, home of the Bingo Bug, Zombie Max, Fusion Extreme, Lucky Plug, F Bomb, and Pike Bomb. Uh, recently, I just picked up some for myself. I'm looking forward to fishing it. Um, they look like some great um, bass and lures and some predator lures, and uh, nothing like fishing largemouth in the summer just it just gets me going and i'm so excited so um get yourself some of lucky bugs uh today and uh yeah heck yeah next up we have northern knits handmade wool hats from anchorage alaska uh she'll make you any combination you want pom-pom no pom-pom she loves making them. You can find Northern Knits on Instagram or on Facebook to place your order today and see uh, what inventory she has available or to get in contact with her and see what she can make and then figure out exactly what you want. So Northern Knits, Instagram and Facebook. Check it out. Keaton and I both have them. You can find her on Instagram under the name at northern dot underscore dot knits next up our friend matt at alaska rod co just released a new lineup of rods for the 2022 season he has some awesome new rods including both spinning uh and fly fishing rods but first the spinning rods they have a lineup of eight freshwater spinning rods with action and power for anglers chasing big aggressive fish with lengths ranging from six foot to nine foot. There are plenty of options for various applications and styles. In a world full of mass produced rods, Alaska Rod Co. makes sure that their rods and service provides what other brands cannot. Rods built and tested in Alaska. Alaska Rodco fly rods are built for harsh environments while maintaining the utmost level of craftsmanship. Right now, Alaska Rodco has nine foot fly rods ranging from five weights to eight weights. 10 foot single hands, switch, and spay rods will be available late this winter or spring. There's enough rod companies out there trying to build the next lightest and flashy rod. Alaska Rodco is here to build you a rod you can pass down generations. Fishing means many things to many different people. Alaska Rod Co. is honored to build you the ultimate tool that connects you to that meaning. We appreciate you guys for taking the time and listening to our podcast, me and Kyle. Uh, we see you listening. We're, we hear you um, giving us good intel on our podcast and how it's going. Um, make sure to go over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review if you can. Um, and even leave us a little comment tell us how we're doing if we're doing good or, or maybe not now spotify is also offering that if you go there and if we're doing great give us five stars we'd really appreciate that uh we th- want to just thank you for listening to our podcast if you're tuning in every week um and uh yeah we're excited and we're excited to bring you some new stuff in the 2022 season Heck yeah, we really appreciate you guys tuning in. We're seeing the ratings, we're seeing the reviews. Let's us know that we're we're doing the right thing. And um, we've had some people reach out on our Instagram and let us know 
uh, what they think about the podcast, giving us some really good feedback, which we really appreciate. And we're putting that um, toward our future episodes. So appreciate you guys. If it wasn't for you, Keaton and I would be talking into microphones to each other for no reason other than to look at each other for three hours at a time, which honestly isn't that bad. Well, on your end, but <laughs> anyways, uh, <laughs> Also, I just want to point out, uh, we hit 1000 listens and that is huge for us for only be, you know, we've only been going a couple months here. So, um, we appreciate you guys. Uh, me and Kyle can't thank you enough. Um, please keep staying tuned. If you can make sure to go on our Instagram, we share our upcoming episodes. We'd like to have questions for, our, um, guests coming onto our podcast. And, um, if you could share, you know, when we're posting a podcast that's going live, if you don't mind sharing it to your friends, we would really, really appreciate that. Um, anything else, Kyle? I think that's it. Let's go ahead and hop into this week's episode with Leif Seberg of Methow Fishing Adventures. Welcome back to another episode of the Young Guides Podcast. I'm Keaton and this is... I'm Kyle. And today we have an awesome guest. Kyle, you want to tell us who we have? Yeah, today we have uh, Leif Seberg. Leif is from uh, Washington, uh, and he's a, a guide in the Metal Valley. Is that correct, Leif? Yeah, yep. Yep, and uh, we reached out to Leif a little while ago. Um, we see him posting on social media, um, commenting on people's posts, and uh, just spreading a lot of good knowledge. He posts a lot of cool photos and um, has a cool story, so figure we bring him on and have him talk about himself a little bit. So welcome to the podcast, Lee. Yeah, right on, you guys. Thanks uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Me and Kyle, you know, before we were getting you on, we're like, man, Leaf is kind of like uh, one of the, you know, founding nails in like fly fishing Washington and stuff. You're, <laughs> you're a big staple. Um, so we were really excited to bring you on, kind of hear your story and get your, get your name out there a little bit more. So right on, man. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah it's it's weird how how time goes by it's uh it's been a um hasn't seemed like a lot of years but yeah i've been like 10 solid years of uh finally being back and fishing the meadow yeah there was a time i felt like i was never going to get back out of uh bellingham where i went to school and and other for like 10 years yeah <laughs> you know how it is in that that era of your life uh, you know, just kind of chilling, partying, going to <laughs> concerts. Yeah, you know, it's never ending. all that kind of thing, uh, and just working so hard. It's like I totally under, I totally understand how um, how some of my clients and, and people coming over here feel sometimes, uh, like um, you know, kind of stuck in a rat race. I was for for a bit over there, wondering if I was uh, ever going to make it home. Yeah. Heck yeah. And we were chatting before we started recording, and it sounds like that's where that's where you grew up, and yeah, it's been a lot of your childhood, huh? Yeah, yeah. I went. I was born and raised here. Went to high school here. A lot of uh, you know, the Menow used to be a lot quieter, uh, especially since COVID. Uh, it's become one of the quote unquote Zoom towns. Uh, we had a lot of the tech folks moving in from um, from Seattle and and abroad and uh and so it's grown a lot but it was so quiet when i was growing up that the first thing a lot of these kids want to do is get the hell out of here um and like we were talking just a little bit about um, before we got on you know i was i was raised out in the sticks and at the time there were many days of super boredom but looking back on it it's like not only would I probably have terrorism charged files charges filed against me, but I just couldn't even get to do some of the stuff I got to do as a kid, you know, like jumping cars. And uh, I was like a total hippie family that grew up next to uh, Ted Nugent's family or something, you know. <laughs> and so this guy would like knock the glass out of cars. He was a race car driver and hell of a mechanic. And his twin boys were a couple of my good friends and. And he'd just weld us up these rally cars with roll cages and stuff and send us up the road for something to do. And 
before we knew it, we'd be jumping them and five Oh grinding literally on trees and, and uh, chasing the cows around and just doing all kinds of stuff. You could never ever do anymore without getting in just too much trouble or being just not even interested because you're sucked into a screen or something. So yeah, yeah lucky, super lucky. And not only, I mean, and not to mention just, it was, um, it was just sort of another thing you took for granted that you got to uh, hunt and fish in just amazing uh, settings. And that, um, uh, you know, I, I'm growing up around a dad that was super into fishing, obviously, and, and learning how to row a boat from him and where to fish from him. And yeah, just absorbing so much knowledge uh, just as a, as a kid, just hanging out, not even trying to. It's, it's uh, not something I take for granted now, that's for sure. So did your, um, did your dad guide on the Met how, or did you guys just fish for fun or? Um, technically, well, I mean, he, he was a fly by night fishing guide. And I would say he was the first one on the Met how, um, back in like in that period of time, I don't know anybody else that was, I mean, maybe some out of town guys would come in and do some stuff for steelhead <clears throat> and most of his stuff was with steelhead and like back trolling plugs and, and some hardware stuff. Uh, but it all kind of came off of really off of one guy. Um, and he kind of built a clientele off of that. And I remember helping him, you know, move boat around when I was a kid and, you know, kind of being boat boy. Uh, and the craziest thing is, and I don't remember if I told you about it, Keaton, maybe I did was, uh, uh, I'm guiding now for a guy that my dad guided for and his kid, is the age I was when, when my dad was, was guiding for him. And so it's just a trip. It's like a full circle situation. And, um, I don't, I mean, I, like I say, I always loved doing stuff, um, like that, but I didn't necessarily think I would ever be a fishing guide. So yeah, yeah kind of interesting how it's come around like that. That's awesome. That's super cool. <clears throat> when did you, did you start guiding then once you uh, moved back to the Valley after being on the West side or were you kind of playing around with that before? Um, no, I, you know, I would come back and um, I enjoyed bringing friends from Bellingham over here and taking them like hiking up in the North Cascades and showing them some of the crazy snowboard stuff and then getting them in the drift boat and um, taking them down the river. So not, you know, I mean, I guess, and even since I was a kid, you know, I'd have family or, friends come into town and it was sort of always a thing where I naturally kind of just started to guide because it was like, I'd already gotten to catch those fish. I'd already been there and done that. And it really took a great amount of joy and just pointing them at it and being like, Oh, right over here, just like that. And having that, you know, you know how it is like, bam, they hit that fish right where you said, right when you said, and you're like, Oh yeah, that's awesome. You know, it's magic. It's a, you know, you're, you're high-fiving, they're slapping you on the back going, how the hell do you know it would be there right there, you know, and it makes you feel good, gives you the warm tinglies even as a kid, so it's just one of those, yeah, it's, uh, I love it, you know, I mean, I, I, sometimes people are like, well, don't you want to fish, you know, and I'm just like, you know, I've, I've already, I, I totally do, but when that person's there, I totally want to watch them catch the fish, so it's just, uh, it's a lot of fun, I think I've, heard of people refer to multiple things like that where you're you're just kind of playing a video game you know you got your controller and you're you're pushing the button going set the hook set the hook you know <laughs> yeah. yeah so um so yeah no i didn't really plan on it and to be quite honest when i came back here part of like that whole rapid growth and change it started to really happen here and it sort of threw me off a little bit uh, to the point where I was kind of looking at a lot of the um, guides or guiding industry or uh, what I was seeing as like, uh, I hate to say it, kind of like river pimps, at least that's what I was calling them. Yeah. Uh, it was just, you know, I'd come back to, to fish my, my home water I'd grown up on and seeing some of the practices um, of some of the fishing guides was just really super annoying, not just for me, but for the rest of the public. And so, <clears throat> you know, I, I, like I say, I never thought I was going to be an actual fishing guide. And a lot of it, um, 
uh, came about when when my older boy was was born with Down syndrome, and we were pretty tight on on cash and and just trying to make you know the paychecks, and so and with my wife not being able to work quite as much, it started to look appealing when I had these younger guys that. Uh, one of them was a friend of mine, started a business and they were guiding and I saw that, yeah, they were making a lot of money and that kind of drew me in to be quite honest first. Um, and I knew that I knew how to do it essentially because I'd kind of al always done it since I was a kid. Um, and I knew I knew how to row a boat. And a lot of the time pe these people were um, paying me for uh, the use of my boat or accesses and uh, I just thought, well, what the hell, you know, I am struggling at this point to support my family. So I might as well give it a shot. And so I, yeah, I did what I might've thought at one point was kind of selling out, but um, you know, I've found uh, it to be a lot different than I thought it would be. And you set your own standards as a guide, you know, you can be a river pimp and um, not care about the resource and take the easy money and do it the easy way. Um, you, you know, you will get a certain amount of clientele uh, that that's good enough for that they don't really know the difference. But um, you can also form really good relationships with really good people. I found, and you can really do it the right way. You can rotate water. You can treat fish well. You can show people how to treat fish well, not just how to catch them, but how to handle them um, and explain to them, you know, why that's important. And, you know, just make sure that they're walking away with a bigger appreciation for the resource than just their Instagram picture um, or just their bragging rights to their buddies. Yeah. You know, I kind of want to elaborate a little bit um, on what you're going, you know, the road you're going down there. I like that you, you know, you talked about you, you get to define what the people see on your, you know, on your trips. I think like when I started guiding, I realized there's that it's not necessarily like power, but you have the control to be able to, you know, if, especially with new anglers that come out, you can show them how it's done right and set the standards high. So when they go out, you know, they can hold that same standard with maybe a new friend they take out or, you know, an angler they go out with, they're like, Hey, let's not hold the fish by the gills or let's not right. do this. This is how I, I was taught. And that's yeah. how you start, a, you know, a trail of great fishermen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, and a lot of, I've also come to not hold it against people as much as I did before. You know, I've gotten older uh, and gained some compassion through many routes, you know, being a parent and, and just a lot of things, just meeting a lot more people. And a lot of it is not purposeful and it's not um, intentional, like to, uh, to be hurtful to the resource. It's just something that they didn't know and a lot of people do appreciate learning uh, a lot. You know, that's one thing that uh, definitely like you can't you can't control the uh, conditions in a day. You can't even really can you can't control the fish's moods, but you can make sure that uh, your clients walk away better fisher people and smarter and and uh, more appreciative of the resource for sure. You just they have to just learn something. That's the only thing you're really there to to do is to keep them safe, you know, point them at it and really just to teach them something each time you're out there. Absolutely. Totally agree. I mean, something that stands out, you talk about that is up here, we have a, the, the pink run is, uh, I wouldn't say incredible. I'd say uh, annoying on how, on how many pinks run up here. Yeah. And um, what I've noticed is a lot of people, especially, uh, people from Alaska, they treat pinks like garbage. And like, yeah. I, like I, I watch people like drag them up on the bank, like step on the fish, like literally rip a hook yeah, out man, and back into the water. And throughout, and usually we don't see that on our trips until like the very end of the day when we're at the takeout and I'll be teaching them all day. You know, we're, we're going to net these fish. We're going to 
keep them wet for a second, maybe get a quick photo and put them back in. We're not going to drag these fish up on the bank. We're not going to yeah. kick mud in their gills. And then we get to the end of the day and they're like, holy crap. Like you were telling us right. that, like to treat these fish well. And then we, now we can see like how other people treat them. And like, that looks terrible. And like, yeah, that's why we're holding the fish correctly. We're doing everything right. So that they don't get all beat up and yeah, there might be a bajillion pinks, but still you don't want to disrespect the resource. Yeah. Yep. Well, I'm also like a big believer in karma, right? Like if you yeah, treat that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. You treat your resources right. You do the right things. You clean up. You do all of that stuff. I've had days where I've gone and done a you know a four or five hour cleanup, go out fishing for the afternoon, and it's like one of my best days of fishing. Yeah, and I, I just think that's good river karma. I mean, believe yeah. it or not, you you believe whatever you want, but I I'm a firm believer in that. No, that's funny you say that because I uh, we had that big Carlton Complex fire and the crazy blowouts and. I had um, my old drift boat, the Scow, and big old clack of craft um, steelheader special from like 1984 or something. So it's big old high sides and just a dumpster with with oars, you know, when you want it to be. <laughs> I was literally, I had it just stacked and I barely had enough room to row. And I was going out by myself to pick up one last pile on this one stretch of river. We still had a steelhead season that, that year. And it had like kicked up my, my boat into this giant pile and I was standing on top fishing from it. And it was so damn good. I, I got like six or seven steelhead barely fishing. And at one point I go, Oh, watch. And I was saying the same thing, Keaton. I'm like, Oh, it's cause I did all this picking up and I'm like, watch this. I can do it just like this. And I covered my eyes with my hand and cast out boom steelhead, like number freaking 11 or something. <laughs> I could not believe it. Yeah. And I was just about to pick up garbage and, uh, yeah it was yeah it's fully like that though oh, and they're little life forms man it doesn't matter what it is. <laughs> if you don't need to kill it or yeah. make it suffer there's no reason to well you know like kyle's talking about salmon runs and stuff it's like yeah right now it's you know it's great it's big you got big alaska right. runs but i mean look at some of our state you know we we almost push some of these fishing spots to extinction because yeah, of this handling fish taking our limit you know all the time so yeah no you can't take it for granted i mean these are the lucky ones that that made it back right i mean that's yeah. what we're we're always worried about is like everything else that's happening to them so yeah. why stick your thumb in the eye of the the few that that made it back yeah well, I, and I think a lot of people don't realize how much these fish, you know, go through on their yeah. journey out from the ocean and back up the river. Like they've survived past a lot of uh, pollution, predators, like you, the list goes on and on. So, and they're important to, you know, the rest of the place. If, if yeah. I mean, sorry about your, your lack of understanding about their importance, you know, if you're kicking them, but uh, it's, um, you know, if they're not important to you, they're going to be important to like the, just the stream quality itself or a bear or some other microorganism that needs it. So, I mean, yeah. even some of the trout in some of these rivers, like they, they survive a big portion of them survive uh, off the salmon returns. So, Oh yeah. Yeah. No, everything. And just even the, you know, the health of the river, I can't remember what it, there was some, something they, they found that's just in chum uh you know and and in chum carcasses that's that's not it's some uh isotope that's not in any of the other uh, salmon that makes them super important and beneficial when they break down in river systems so it's just you know just even the decaying meat of these fish is super important to the health of our, our river systems here absolutely that's super cool i never i never knew that that's, that's yeah really cool that, to, to think that is yeah, I, I wish I could remember what it was, but it's it's been a long time ago I heard about that one. Heck yeah. And, and you know um, a lot about that kind of stuff, right? Because you're also uh, a fish biologist. Is that is that the correct? Uh, fish uh, gotcha. So I am more in the, well, I would say like the hatchery end. I mean, I guess, you know, that's all I could really say. Although the fish I work with are wild fish. Um 
we and the and the you know the uh, the program there at the federal hatchery. I guess I need to break it down. Our is is the steelhead program that's a brood stock of of wild fish based on the the native uh, genetics left in the upper Columbia system that would probably be most represented by the uh, the methow um, because of its suitability. Um, even though at the point of which they took the initial brood stock in like '53, uh, the methow had been dammed uh, all but the lower like three miles but it's some pretty good spawning habitat and there's a lot of other uh, tributaries where those fish luckily kept up. The Okanagan's not so great, but it does have some good tributaries like um, Salmon Creek for one, for sure, uh, which has always been one of those though that's been drawn from a lot, like by the orchardists around here. That's kind of our uh, big draws in the Okanagan, um, then that kind of area was was orchard here it's more in the Medhow. it's more like ranches and stuff like that mm -hmm. anyway they they managed to keep up long enough for the federal hatchery to start their brood program uh like i say with fish coming back past wells dam in 1953 and it's been a wild brood stock ever since and then the yakima nation uh started their Medhow steelhead um kelp facility there i guess it's been um almost 10 years now i came on about five years ago uh, so it's been about eight years i think for them eight nine years something like that there um and you know initially it was just part of a study uh program where they just had a few of them that they set up initially to see um you know multiple things where where the fish were going after they were uh reconditioned um how likely they were to spawn where they spawn with who they spawn um you know the more you do stuff like this the more you come up with more questions like well we noticed that some some amount of these fish would just take right off after they're reconditioned and go back out to the ocean for one maybe two seasons and then come back again some fish would just stay in basin when released in like say uh, October, November and over winter and then spawn consecutively rather than skipping a year or two. And so we looked at the consecutive spawners to see what, uh, you know, if anything was different about them and, and right away what jumps out is the, uh, basically like an estrogen or estradiol uh, level in the fish, you know, Keep in mind, most of these fish that we're doing this with are female, uh, so we can measure that hormone and see if it's higher or lower in some of these fish. And we've we've kind of got this, you know, this this range where we feel like we know whether or not um, when we let them go, they're going to be ready to consecutively spawn or skip a spawn. Um, in that case, a lot of the time, we um, are going to want to just hold on to them rather than kind of wasting our time and resources and rolling the dice on sending them back out again. Yeah. Uh, they're quite likely going to do well. And we've seen them do pretty well uh, when that is the case, because when we let them go, at least we're letting them go after about four or five months of reconditioning with us. Uh, because, you know, the whole reason we're doing this is that these fish uh, when they try to spawn and get back out with these, you know, eight, nine dams, depending on, on where they're at, um, and like 800 miles to swim, they, uh, they have to swim it now where they used to really just kind of have to keep their nose upstream, do some breathing, do some ruddering and let that spring flow, push them back out after they spawn relatively little effort involved. Uh, now they have to swim back out through what's basically like a motionless reservoir. I mean, it's got some downstream current, but you know how the Columbia is. It's not, it's not a raging river. It's not pushing them out. Um, so the other big number that we look at when we're um, considering releasing our fish uh, is the, the fat percentage that's in the fish. And so that really gives you the, the, 
the number that shows you why they can't make it back out. When we when we do our, our pre-spawn measurements, these fish are, you know, it's not huge, but they're running like uh, five to 10% body fat. They're doing okay, you know, but after they've uh, overwintered and dug and spawned and defended their reds and then uh, started their journey back out, they're literally sitting at maybe 1% body fat. 3% at the most, at the most I usually ever see out of these fish. And these are the fish that we are spawning in the hatchery that I'm measuring, getting these measurements out of. If they're beating themselves up in the wild, uh, then you're talking less than a percentage of body fat by the time they've even made it out to Wenatchee. Um, that's where we are able to intercept um, some fish that, that have spawned in the wild we, um, not to bounce back and forth with you too much here, trying to make it a little bit of a timeline, but, you know, we take those uh, around 40, 45 fish that are used in broodstock from the national hatchery here and recondition those fish. And at the end of the summer, we see how many are ready to be let go and we let go the ones we can. But we also, the whole time, are trying to recruit fish from downstream of our river system at the uh, Rock Island Dam south of Wenatchee. And because of it being down there, we're able to also recruit fish coming off the Wenatchee, the Inyat, the Methow, and the Okanagan River. And anything coming down off their wild spawning, we're able to recondition them, reintroduce them below their, um, their stream of origin so that they can hopefully do it there too. And we're looking at, um, or I should say the Yakima is looking at doing a program, hopefully uh, uh, closer to the Wenatchee system, I, I think in the future to focus more on the Wenatchee fish. Um, because right now, you know, obviously our uh, biggest solid number that we can get each year is that, that brood stock that we take uh, from the national hatchery. And in order to do that, we air spawn those fish. So they don't have to be eviscerated and lethally spawned like you usually see in a hatchery situation. Um, we'll just simply puff up the abdomen, express the eggs, uh, and then just, you know, give them their, their usual workup that we do in a lot of these situations, just a, a general physical, how big, how long, uh, some DNA, uh, you know, some scales and things like this so that we can, you know, keep track of how old the fish is, what its, what its life history has been, um, and then, you know, just kind of treat them with some prophylactic drug treatments has really, really been, uh, benefit beneficial to these fish, because if we're not able to, uh, you know, do that, then we lose a, a, a very large number before I started with, uh, the program, they were, they were getting hammered by just the, uh, copepods that you'll see a lot of time on these fish's gills or soft tissue. I call their armpits, you know, they're under their pecs, you know, any of these little soft crevices, you get these little uh, mucusy looking, maggoty looking white things. And those are uh, the Western copepod, which with uh, warmer water or bad water conditions, they can really, really go crazy. We've had them almost wipe out completely the, uh, the native um, kokanee and Palmer Lake over here. A bunch of our still water stuff was getting hammered by it. Uh, you know, anytime we have a really warm season. So, you know, we hit them with prophylaxis and then we hit them with a bunch of TLC, you know, just uh, food and love and, and uh, lack of stress. And uh, yeah, like I said, then after the summer, we, we run our tests on them. Uh, when we can, we do operate some um, remote traps, but there are a ton of challenges in, in doing that. And we found um, at least in this last couple of years that we've had to focus on just getting the fish that we can from the rock island dam which will include some of those fish that we usually get in our remote traps here the remote trapping is really interesting in that it's kind of like the remote trapping that people do on small streams for other fish except we're trying to get fish going out so we have to build these funky weir systems that allow fish to to migrate up the stream like steelhead heading up uh to be able to do their spawning run up and we have to make sure that we're also not um hanging up you know other fish that are trying to head down or anything like this other than the ones we're trying to intercept so yeah 
that was kind of interesting, you know, kind of trying to switch gears from having trapped a lot of fish in their upstream migrations for years. And then, and then all of a sudden trying to turn my thinking around, catch fish that are, that are heading back out. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a unique, uh, program. It's a really cool program. And, um, I don't know if people really thought about how, um, important it might be in the long run when they first started thinking of these, uh, programs. I mean, the main reasoning was that, um, that the dams <clears throat> were believed to be the reason that, um, you know, our natural um, repeat spawning percentage here, it's, you know, kind of speculatory, but would be somewhere in that 10% range, you know, uh, is less than a percent mm -hmm. because of the fact that the dams hammer the fish as they're trying to uh, make it back out, just like it does for the juveniles, except for like we discussed here, the, these, these ladies have no, no reserves left. So yeah, yeah that's kind of it in a nutshell. <clears throat> I got a question for you. Um, yeah. What is like the fatality rate of a, a, like a natural fish, fish coming up, spawning, turning around? Is it kind of a death trip for it once it gets up there? If you, like you guys don't take care of it, shows some, yeah. it it's pretty much like, will they die or? What's yeah, like I say, it's like less than a percent that make it back out wow, um, that you'll see repeat spawn yeah. if you're you know you're talking like a, a 30 40 mile run with yeah. no dams like over there uh on the peninsula or something you'd literally be talking 30 40 percent could sometimes be kelt yeah uh so your numbers drastically change just from uh length of travel uh so then you throw in some dams and it's just like before you know it you're getting to less than a whole number I mean, it's just, it's, uh, it's less than a percent that, that we measure up here as far as the repeat spawners. And so that's why it's just, you know, um, critically important that we keep that part of their DNA. I mean, it's, it's hard to say you, how fast you could wash something like that, that out of these fish, but, you know, it's critically important that it's, that it stays strong in them uh, to be able to do this repeat spawn. And then we have what we, we call idioparity in these fish and that's multiple life history displays. And that's, you know, the, one of the cool things about steelhead, especially here, like inland with the, with the gardenary steelhead is that, um, you know, they could be a, a resident red band trout, uh, or they could be a steelhead, uh, a resident red band could mate with a steelhead and throw off any number of steelhead progeny and any number of resident trout progeny. And, it's still in their DNA and it back in their genes close enough to where two of those resident fish could then mate and still throw off steelhead. And if something happened to an ocean going group of fish any given year, even if we lose a God forbid an entire uh, year of fish, we'd yeah. still have these fish in land that could at any point still throw off anadromous uh, progeny. Uh, so it's just, you know, well, you see them here, to, and I don't know if it's quite as much on the Yakima, but we have, um, and I talk about it all the time on the report or at different times of the year, um, but we have like these, these fish that'll just go as far as um, the Columbia. And uh, I think a lot of years you see more of those fish just because uh, you're seeing less of the fish that went to the ocean. They just plainly had a, a terrible return. They went out there, didn't find food or found a, a found a, a giant net a giant yeah. uh, trawler um and didn't make it back and so you start you just see a lot more uh at fluvial fish that uh just went as far as your estuaries and and uh fattened up as much as they could there and came back albeit uh uh smaller but mature so you know it's uh it's a good thing that they have that multiple life history display uh I look at it like kind of a, you know, another type of egg banking that they have naturally done that that's obviously paid off for them uh, over time. And, uh, you know, that's that, um, uh, if fish can be flexible, it's definitely gonna be uh, to their, you know, it's gonna be better for them in the long run with yeah. the, the way conditions are changing. But like we see, you know, 
it also depends on how their migration patterns uh, work out there. It depends on if they take a right or a left. Mm -hmm. um, we know a lot of our steelhead um, really like to head kind of more over towards Russia. I mean, some of the longer trips of some of these fish going through multiple international yeah. boundary waters, uh, you know, and just uh, they could make it easier on themselves. That's for sure. Sometimes they're kind of overachievers. Yeah. I'm afraid. That's a long ways to go. Sure is, man. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what's so much sweeter over there. <laughs> I, uh, I can't, this might be a silly question, um, but I'm, I'm very curious. Um, do you ever see like, I know kind of steelhead at their particular who they spawn with, but do you ever see like, um, like cutthroat ever trying to spawn with the steelhead or <sighs> I know there's like cut bows. Right. Um, but I was just yeah. wondering if there's yeah. you ever seen anything of that sort. Um, I haven't physically seen them doing it, but yeah. um, you know, obviously there's some sort of partition. It's either one or more things it's either. And, but it's not, complete but it's it's something because it's not rampant but if you're a cutthroat in the um you know not in the headwaters here you're not going to be mating with anybody that's even a a, a pure cutthroat i mean it's yeah. there's a lot of uh hybridization in our system here obviously yeah. um so i think that a lot of it is that there's just not as many cutthroat that return um to spawn in these areas. Um, so they're not necessarily physically partitioned. Uh, there might be a little bit of um, time partitioning as far as they might be a little earlier or later, but obviously um, for any cutthroat, you know, below these headwaters, they're, they're having a hard time finding anybody quote unquote pure to spawn with because yeah, you just, you'd be hard pressed to find any cutthroat in the, in the med house system yeah that are of pure cutthroat dna but that's why we also yeah have these massive massive cutthroat i mean yeah uh i think the biggest i've seen are in that like 28 29 inch range yeah. uh, you know eight eight pound fish so that's wow. that's just way beyond the average size of a west slope cutthroat you know but that's what that's what got me you know i've seen some pictures and seen some uh of the stuff you've shared and i'm like that just doesn't seem like a natural yeah. cutthroat because I mean, well yeah. yeah and those are those ad fluvial fish that i talk about too yeah like those fish aren't aren't staying totally resident in the meadow system yeah. those fish are heading down by like pateras uh you know down by chief joseph dam somewhere in those pools and finding bigger feed good source food, getting good food sources and yeah stuff. and maybe a little bit mellower conditions somehow to not burn quite as much of that caloric intake yeah um that's yeah nice. because they're just they're rotund and and that's part of kind of you know i you probably know but like the the westies are really super habitualized to, to stay like in one spot you know they're very uh you know they'll live their whole life in like one run and uh just go upstream and spawn there again kind of like kind of like steelhead and kind of like bull trout like not usually there's, there's probably a point in their life where say around four or five years old, they begin to spawn. And for a few years there, they're probably, you know, young and fit and able enough to consecutively spawn maybe two, three years in a row, maybe more or something, but then that it becomes harder on them, that reconditioning process. So they start to skip a year here or there. And, um, you know, generally the oldest ones that we'll see in the med house system are going to be in that like 11, maybe 12 year old range so consider that fish has maybe spawned four times yeah. or a handful of times uh but you know i've i've literally just watched some of these fish come back to the same runs for two or three years in a row and, and can really even see um like i swear like a family facial resemblance in some of these fish in that area of stream like oh they have a funny little button nose up there like where i caught hank the tank three years in a row just like he did and just yeah. weird little things so i don't know and maybe it's just me overthinking it but uh yeah it's really really neat to see the uh 
the life history displays of all these fish, especially the cutthroat. And um, we've been around here, like myself and a few of these, these guys at the fly club and, and some of the other uh, biologists have really been wanting to do some, some work and, and study uh, the cutthroat and see what the heck they, they do and where they spawn and when they spawn and, and all these things. And so we're working on that right now and we have been, but it's, it's getting, it feels like uh, it's getting closer to where we're going to start to do some stuff. Uh, I'd really like to be doing, you know, just the same, those general workups, get a baseline uh, population study going where we just see how many are there, what, you know, what, what, a what degree are they hybridized, you know, uh, in the population, just get some age studies, um, some density studies, some uh, figure out where they're spawning. Some of those, some of those questions that, that we have can be answered just with, uh, you know, taking some DNA samples, taking some scales, uh, and doing like we do with our, with our steelhead and tagging these fish and tracking them through our pit array systems. Um, you know, there's a, a universal system that you may have heard about that we'll use for tracking this fish called Patagis. And so everybody, no matter, you know, it's Yakima or WDFW or National Fisheries or yada, yada, uh, they can all put their data into this database. It's called Patagis. And they, um, that way we can track every fish that, that, you know, even if it's not one of our fish, uh, if it's tagged, then every time it goes over an array, a pit array, an antenna system that we put into the bottom of these rivers here that you see in the pipes and conduits or whatever, um, then we can see what that what the migratory history of that fish is. So yeah. it's it's pretty neat to see some of these that maybe we've never laid a hand on, but uh, you know, it got tagged way over there by somebody else X amount of years ago. There's you might have heard that story, the one over on the snake that it was like an eight-year-old uh, Celt steelhead that had returned like three or four times or some crazy thing like that, thousands and thousands of miles under her fins. So, yeah, so we'd, we'd just, we'd get these fish tagged. We'd, we'd take some some samples and um, we'd just track them, figure out what the heck they're doing. So that's that's kind of a fun, uh, just on the side uh, venture that I'm, I'm looking into. Yeah. And we can tell how passionate you are about this leaf. Like we, we loved, we loved hearing that. And it, it kind of helps us understand um, why you emphasize taking care of the resource. I mean, I, I, I would hope, and I, I, I tend to speak from experience that most guides want to take care of the resource, right? Because that's not just what we love, but that's where we work. That's our job. But it sounds like, like you're you're so passionate about taking care of these fish and learning more about these fish and knowing the stresses that these fish undergo throughout their life that and you you, you kind of see things from a, a different angle i guess i could say yeah well i mean i kind of see it in my my son uh he's the same way as i am and i know that my wife doesn't always wish i was like it but i don't I don't do a whole lot of things halfway. I wish I could be a little mellower about some of the stuff I do and just kind of do it, but I don't know. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's been something that I've always loved the outdoors here since I was a kid and I had, you know, been doing graphic design over there in Bellingham and was stuck in a, um, in a cubicle actually doing freaking coding and stuff like that, a job you know, I always loved doing art, but I never thought I was going to be like a desk guy or something like that. So I was shocked to find myself in that kind of position. And um, when I, when I found, you know, the fisheries program and was able to find a job doing, you know, outdoor stuff with the, you know, I'd always loved fishing a ton as a kid over here. And so to just be able to be on the river as work, um, was super appealing. And then I kind of fell into reading a lot of um, Robert Benke's books. I don't know if you've uh, ever checked him out, but he's really good, a really good ichthyologist that just uh, is one of the leading names in it. But he's he's done a ton of great books and they're really just great for the layman, for uh, just a regular guy to read. It's not super dry. It's super interesting. 
Um, and right away you're, you're, you're like his observations about fish. You're like, Oh yeah, I've noticed that about fish. And then you start looking for these other observations that he points out about fish before you know it, you're kind of really building a repertoire of like, fish id you know and a lot of his books were around before there was like dna so you could actually count gill rakers and whether there were teeth on the on the tongue or vomer or roof of the mouth uh how many scales in the lateral line um and all these different things to like decipher whether a fish was hybridized or not more likely and you know just uh yeah i just found him a really easy uh author to, to study and um and just throughout the years of working in fisheries have just really gained a lot of knowledge just on the job and um, not even there again, like kind of like learning to row a boat for my dad or where all these fishing places were just not really noticing how much I was learning until, you know, I'd had like 10 years under my belt with WDFW and came over to work with Yakima to more or less sort of um, bring their kelp program more up to date as far as the facility goes with with my um experience in how to operate facilities what the pitfalls can be with um raising or taking care of fish in a in that condition and you know basic maintenance qualities of keeping uh a building going say when it's like you know below zero and and what your fallback procedures are defcon one two three and four in case anything happens because you're handling a living resource that that definitely demands that respect that you know exactly how to handle it even if it's just jettisoning those fish and taking them back to the river and making sure that they stay alive you know and so just yeah it's it's uh it's something you really um have to care about because apathy is the absolute enemy of of anyone that's in an important situation like that, where things most of the time are okay, but the one day you didn't make sure they weren't, but it, it all goes wrong. And so it's only as important as, as you make it like a lot of things, you know? And so that's sort of always been my mindset in how I approach the, the handling of those fish too, because there again, it's like, they're ever more important every day. And I don't think we ever thought that um, that few of fish could be so important. But when we're looking at some of our wild returns here, dropping, you know, the way they have, just to have that additional insurance of that many more um, mature spawning fish in the basin, it's, you know, it's very important. And, you know, uh, some of the stuff I was talking about earlier too, just even, you know, to get back kind of to guide stuff, it's like, you know, there again, it's important to not take the easy money and to be rotating the water that you're working. I see a lot of these people. And like you say, you know, Kyle, it's like uh, we all, most of us get into it because we we love fishing. There's a certain amount of people that want to be the man or whatever, you know, uh, or do it because it, you know, they want to be cool or whatever, but usually, um, usually the, the hard work and the real, uh, the reality of the situation will burst those people's bubble within a season or two. Uh, so you do have like that, that core of people that for the most part, um, really do it because they love the fish. But then even those folks, I think, I, I guess is what I was going to point out can get corrupted uh, just by time. You know, we're all, we're all just human. And one of the things I've noticed in guiding that I would definitely, you know, warn any of my, my younger uh, peers about um, because I'm quickly slipping outside of the young guides age um is that it's you know it can be i read a like an article that summed it up pretty good in outdoor magazine last month about the stresses of um they were talking about river guides but a lot of it's the same or you know uh, whitewater well a lot of it's the same with fishing guides you know they um they end up kind of alone a lot of the time or away from their family or loved ones um it's a high stress job where you're super important and needed and essential during this period of time. 
and then like completely out of people's minds at another period of time, usually through like the winter or your, your, your slow season, you have lots of money when you're operating and then very little through your slow season. Yeah. Um, a lot of guides, myself included, definitely uh, can fall into, you know, substance abuse. Uh, there were some years there where I just plain was drinking way too much. I was, um, you know, I'm not afraid to talk about it. It was, it was super stressful. When I first started my business, we lost our house in a fire. Um, I resigned from WDFW and I quit working with the other guide company that I started with because one of the uh, old owners tried to force me into a do not compete clause. And it was like all in one year and, you know, just about lost my mind and yeah. trying to raise a family, having a kid with special needs and everything else. Um, you know, it was not like I would drink on my job, but from the moment I would get done with my day, I would drink to manage like pain and, and stress and things like that. And just, uh, was not in a good way, you know, for some periods of, of my life and years past. And, um, a lot of it was, you know, the stress just of life and trying to learn um, where, who I was and where, where I start and end and where the guide starts and ends and who and how, how I can be important to myself and people around me outside of that because that's not like anything, it's just temporary. So you can't ever let your identity ride on anything, any one thing or your, your happiness, I should say. Um, it's okay to identify, I guess, as a certain thing, but, um, but to just know that, um, that, that the things are always just temporary and that the most important things are the uh, relationships that you foster uh, around you and just uh, keeping those things strong, keeping yourself healthy um, and, and just doing, trying not to uh, compromise yourself or your happiness uh, to, to try to get to where you think you need to be. Because it was like, it seems like the, when I just, let it happen a little bit more and manage myself a little bit better. The whole thing became a hundred times better. And I mean, it was positive from the beginning. Most any problems I had were self-imposed, you know, as far as schedules being too crazy or too much stuff going on in my life or, you know, losing a house or something, not self-imposed, but I mean, it was totally outside of guiding. Because like I say, most everything I've experienced since I decided to start guiding was super positive. And I have found some relationships, like I think I told you, Keaton, a few of these folks have just become really, you know, close to me. And uh, and it's 100% different in some ways than I thought it would be as far as guiding goes. Um, but yeah, in, 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 in a ton of different ways. So I just, I guess, I, I guess I would definitely just uh, caution folks getting into it to know what it really is and to know that it's not, you know, just some crazy live in the dream Instagram thing and, yeah. and to be careful about how they, they manage their business. I definitely don't concern myself with buying a new truck and a new boat every other season to try to, to look cool. Um, I am a more of a uh, function over form guy. I make sure my clients are comfortable and they have everything they need, but you know, I make sure that I'm not stressed out about, um, you know, having a, a $50,000 truck and boat to try to make payments on. I see a lot of, you know, folks, will, a lot of my guide peers, more like with the guys that have to do giant, like a Luma weld boats or, you know, salmon stuff like that. They get giant boats and giant trucks and and they turn them over like again and again and again. And before you know it, they're kind of caught in that loop of just trying to pay the bills on all the stuff that they, that they have. And, you know, really what I want to be able to do is just concentrate on 
on being a teacher to uh, uh, to my clients or or just being if they just want a companion that is skilled and knowledgeable than than being that you know but um, yeah I just uh, I like to keep it stripped down and simple make sure that it's making me happy and that my my family is happy and that I'm not working uh, too much and I'm very fortunate that. You know, my, my boy, Leo, uh, with Down syndrome is, he's a super highly functioning kid. He's been back to school for a few years now. And my younger boy, they're both back. They're both in school as much as they can be these days. Yeah. So my wife's also back to work. So financially, you know, things have gotten, uh, better than they were. Um, still a blue collar guy, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's nice to just be able to only guide as much as I want to and to set my standards that way and to be able to enjoy the experience and to know how to enjoy the experience um, more than I used to. Yeah. That was very well said. I... Yeah, and <clears throat> very important for people who are uh, in the industry now or who are interested in coming in. I think that's some of the, yeah, yeah. the realest um, advice that we've got from anybody we've talked Absolutely. to. So that was Yeah. Great. You know, and I would definitely, want you guys to know i'm always there to you know to give you advice or anything like that just as a as a peer you know slash friend in that in that way uh I, it was like a few years back i read an article about a guy that just he was a fly guide down on the on the ron and i can't remember his name and uh or maybe it was the deschutes or something i can't remember uh he freaking committed suicide and i've just i've just seen just seen a lot of depression uh, in the in the game when uh, when people don't really realize that that it can happen and it's just uh, it's avoidable. It, it doesn't have to happen. Just just have to make sure you you just approach it in the right way and and are realistic about it. You know, one thing too is um, I like that you're really open with us and stuff and you're willing that if we needed advice we could come to you because i think that uh there's like a silent rule in between guide services and stuff that oh you know we can't really talk to each other say stuff and it's like you know at the end of the day like yeah we're competing you know guide services but like we're still fishing the same resource you know it's how you lay your impression out to not only your clients, but to the, your, I would almost consider other guides, your coworkers, you know, on the river. Definitely yeah. peers, man. Yeah. yeah. All work together. Take so. it or leave it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I've not always been this way. Like yeah. I say, I, I was a, a lot more confrontational in my youth. Uh, <laughs> still work constantly on keeping, you know, myself in a positive and mellow mind yeah. because, uh, if other people were around right now, I'm sure someone's laughing in the other room listening to me talk right now. <laughs> uh, I just, yeah, it's, it just is, it's for the better of everybody. Uh, and really, if you're just, if you're confident in your own skills and in the, um, and in the relationships you've fostered, you know, that your, your clients are your clients, uh, because they like being with you, um, they're always welcome to go somewhere else and they choose not to for a reason and just, um, you know, try to, try to keep it that way. It just, uh, it's, it's much easier to just, to, 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 what is it to get bees with honey or, or, or whatever that, you know, it's, it's not, it's not going to, you're not going to win in the end by fighting and it's just going to detract from everybody's time. And, you know, it's equally important to, I, was the other thing I would say um, that first set me off with the way I would see guides working is, is disrespecting the public. And that's like another important, important thing that we can do to, um, to make the whole thing better for everybody is to just be cool to people in public. You know, it's like uh, constantly I'm trying to maybe do it a little too much overcompensate, I guess, uh, bend over backwards, but, I don't, I don't think it's wrong. I, you know, I'll give people bugs all the time. I'll point out a particular stretch of river. Uh, 
I'll be like, Hey, go here, try this, you know, sorry, I might've spoiled your run, but I won't be over here. I won't be over there. Yada, yada. Try to, you know, try to make it up to them, try to make a good impression. Um, you know, because I think that that will change their opinion really quickly. You know, you see them fishing a run, you know, shout out to them. Hey, can I get behind you? You know, do everything you can do to be cool to them. And if they, if they don't reciprocate, just let it be what it is. And, you know, your, your, your clients definitely don't need to see you be an asshole to them anyway. So, uh, and not to mention, it's just, I, I've had a ton of people. Uh, I mean, it just, it, uh, it just feels better to be a nice person anyway, but I've had a ton of people be like, yeah, man, uh, I, yeah, we already met. You, you gave me flies that one day and told me about a place to go and I caught a fish there and it was awesome. And thanks so much, you know, and, and it just, that feels a hell of a lot better than exchanging. Fuck you. You know, it's just, <laughs> so yeah. And it just, it'll, it'll get you, it'll get you better references if, if you want to look at it like a businessman, but I really just, I prefer to look at it like a karma thing for yeah. sure. Well, and it, you know, take out the, the guide service and take out everything. It comes down to what type of person you yeah. are at the end of the day too. Yep. Uh, I just, you know, same as you, as if I'm floating by someone or I accidentally didn't see them and I come around a corner and they're there, you know, I try to be like, tell them what's working for us that day. Cause I'm like, and you know, your clients sometimes will be like, well, why did you tell them that? I'm like, well, we got all this water ahead of us. That yeah. guy's fishing this one area. And if I just told them what flies to use and it gives them a little more luck, I mean, better to them. So, yeah. That's... Yeah. Rarely have I had anybody have a problem with that. People yeah. are usually like, oh yeah, hey, that was nice. You know? Um, yeah. That's just, it's it's, feel, <laughs> it feels good. Yeah, good. it does. And, uh, everybody's just out to try to have a good time and uh it seems to be harder and harder to do anymore too and there's there's just plenty of people that i don't know i don't i don't understand the whole idea of trying to low hole or trying to i mean i guess it, it's sort of a five stages of of uh fishing thing and i've finally hit about you know fourth stage or so or so i'm still trophy hunting uh but i'm ever more happy just to be there stage yeah. five so uh yeah i think it also is just a maturity thing i think a lot of time people when they're first starting to fish they're again just like they don't know how to handle fish well they don't know how to handle other fishermen very well and they are more there they just might not even know the etiquette or or it might not have just happened to meet some random person one day and be cool with them and just strike up a, a, a cool conversation with a cool person and this might not have had that that experience yet you know i remember i was up fishing a high mountain lake um it's pretty technical uh fishing the first time i went up there I was chasing a state record and i released two and thought i would definitely claim it because i had three more days up there and i didn't catch any more uh well i caught one more that was like 16 inches in that whole trip but i came back up to that same lake because I had stocked it on the first trip uh, with some cutthroat to catch the cutthroat I'd put in eight years prior. And they were all like 25 to 26 inch, 27 inch fish. Wow. And I was, my first day I got like 11 or 12 of them. It's like, yeah, yeah. Could not go wrong. Just crushing it on dry flies. And I saw this, uh, this guy up there as I was walking back to camp, was skipping back to camp, I should say. And this guy's just like, Oh man, you were just crushing it down there at the other end of the lake. What, you know, can I ask you what you're using? I was unable to catch anything this last couple of days. And I was like, Oh, you know, it's, there's this little cinnamon Brown calabatus out there right now. And I was just using coachman, just anything with a upright wing was yeah. crushing it. And I, I was like, well, you know, just, uh, if you want to, come out with me tomorrow morning then, then come out with me in the morning i'll show you and man i took him out there to the other end of the lake the next day and got him into like a half dozen of them before i left that next day and just the experience of doing that was just so much fun and that guy was so so appreciative and he had ended up he was the dentist from up in winthrop and uh he came back and did a trip uh i think it was on a donation with another 
of my regular clients uh, for like the community center or something. But it was awesome to see him again a couple of years later. He's like, man, I still tell my friends about that time you guided for me up there at that lake. You know, it just, yeah, it just feels great to, to have those, those times like that with complete strangers or, you know, just uh, I've met a ton of really uh, nice people um, in the last however many years, even outside of my, my client uh, relationships, um, you know, just kind of doing just the, yeah, like meeting people through, um, through our online forums and stuff like that. And there, there are just so many nice folks. It's hard to, to not want to, to give them a little bit of advice or help them out a little bit. And then you hear these great stories about the time they had with their, their kid or whatever fish in the spot you told them to fish and, um, and, and just get to start hanging out with some of these folks, uh, and going out fishing with them too. is just really great. We're going to have to get out there and get, do some fishing. Yeah, absolutely. Heck yeah. Sounds great. I mean, I've been trying to get over there. It's just, it's a long way over oh, yeah. And yeah. And everything. So yep. we're going to have to make some time this year for sure. Yeah, totally. Heck yeah. All right. Yeah. So I'll I'm trying to think that's, that's kind of really all I was, I was trying to think of about like wanting to mention about guiding, you know, just basically yeah. kind of those things about, uh, you know, uh, etiquette and, yeah. And, you know, those, those few, few warnings about, you know, don't hit the booze too hard. <laughs> uh, take care of yourselves, yeah, totally. you know, always, you know, always be thinking around the corner, but that's always kind of been something that I've tried to keep in mind with everything in life. You know, what's next after this, or how can you, you know, branch to the next thing using this or, uh you know you can't can't be on the sticks when you're over 50 60 years old you know or or you have to have your own company and have some guys moving your boats for you or just you know stuff like that and and, and these are questions i'm still thinking of but um you know i would i would kind of also reckon, recommend that as well especially you know with this ever changing world as far as the fisheries go uh, um but you know it's it's good to be in in the whole trout thing for sure because i've seen my friends that tried to bank on salmon boy they just that one really kicked them in the ass yeah. uh, so just try to think longevity in your resource and your game to kind of add on to you know your friends i had a friend who um, he started his own steelhead guiding service and that year we had COVID hit, we had closures, uh, OP closures. And yeah, he, well, I just pretty much donated money to, you know, Clacka state of Washington. And he's like, I didn't really make anything back because yeah. of all that. So that, that, like you said, that hit people hard. And that's kind of what turned me off a little bit about that is just seeing him do that. And I was like, well, I, I really like trout fishing and I rather go this direction than trying to yeah. rely on, you know, maybe every other year having a good, a decent run of salmon or steelhead. So. No, get to where you could treat that as like a bread and butter, you know, yeah. but I mean, or just like a, like a, a cream on top, but your bread and butter has got to be something else. I mean, God, you know, I can't even remember how many steelhead seasons I got to do before they shut down. I mean, you know, I've been guiding for like 10 years, but I still only got to do like four or five seasons before they shut it down. Cause what it's, yeah, we haven't had one in like five years here, six years. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a tough one, man. But um, yeah, as long as you're smart about it, there's no reason it, it can't, can't work out. Uh, do you guide mostly on the Yakima Keaton? Yeah, and I do a little bit on some uh, urban rivers mm -hmm. uh, over on this side. Um, I I have like a, a weird passion for urban rivers. I think they're that there's just something so unique about you know catching a, a big rainbow under like four oh five. Oh yeah, it's yeah. weird to me, but I love it. Yeah. Like, and yeah, that's, I, yeah, 
I think it like turns a lot of people away and I'm like, well, you're missing out. So there's, if you can find fish close to home, man, yeah. I, I, if I can fish, I'm a fish no matter where I'm at. I got a few little like creeks and rivers near my house and I yeah. pretty much become a river rat. Like I'm like, I get off work. I'm yeah. like, okay, nice knowing you guys. I'm going yeah. fishing. Yeah. And then I come home and I roll in at dark and yeah. you know, my family's like, man, I we thought you died out there. I was like, no, there was a really good hatch. I like, you know, in the summer, you know, 9 PM. And I'm like, yeah. out there trying yeah. to see my fly go <laughs> yeah, you know, happening. So I, How about uh, you, Kyle, what kind of, fishing do you do up there um so mainly um just on the road system um doing trout's kind of our bread and butter but yeah. when you got a bajillion salmon coming in for two months out of the year that's kind of um where things change and i i got it on the acoma for three three and a half years and, and are you then, working for an outfitter up there uh yeah yeah working for an outfitter up here um but uh just thing things change so much in how we target trout and the types of areas we target trout like from the Yakima going from a river that's cooking like 3500 to 4000 cfs in the summer to um the summer up here on this the creek that i guide on a high day is like 450 cfs uh, yeah so just yeah. changing from kind of the the tailwater kind of like the yakima is big river not a lot of obstacles to the creek where it's tiny log jams you're in a raft you're bouncing off logs and you're fishing yeah and you're fishing like dalai lamas versus like a, a big old dalai lamas like your bread and butter versus right. like a size eight pats or something on the yak like yeah. things are totally different um and then just just the size and just just how these fish act is totally different and that's it's been fun to, to try to learn that and see how things per, uh, change throughout the season. Yeah. Uh, and then when you're targeting trout there just off of the um, breakup and then they're there eating, putting on weight before the salmon get there by eating other things like lampreys and mice and the salmon get there and then they're on eggs and they're on flesh right. and then you end out the year just basically. pretty dynamic. Yeah. Yeah, totally different. I, I really like how it all changes and um, it makes me appreciate what I had before um, okay. in Washington. Um, I've been tying flies all winter and for some odd reason, I'm filling up all of my nymph boxes and I, I want to be doing that almost more than filling up my streamer boxes for up yeah. here because yeah. um, I miss what I had down there, but I also appreciate what I have up here. Yeah. Cool. And how old are you? Uh, I'm 23. And not not nailed down with a girlfriend or anything like that yet? <laughs> yeah, I, I am. Uh, I've been married yeah. for okay. uh, three years. Kids? Uh, not yet. Nope. No. But right, you can still, you can yes. still get kind of crazy. How about you, Keaton? Uh, I'm just, I got a girlfriend. She's, yeah. She's awesome. She does some As long as you don't have kids, you can get away with most everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah that's one thing i would say definitely like take that opportunity to do any crazy guiding thing that you want to do before you have kids because yeah. you can't disappear for months at a time like part of me wishes i would have done a little bit of something like kamchatka or you know some crazy thing like that do some russian adventure in mongolia or something <laughs> like that but i'll just have to do it as an old man there you go just get somebody else wrote it for you yeah yeah get a babysitter for a long time and just right <laughs> kyle, yeah. kyle if the guide service doesn't work out you can hire kyle he'll come there we go there we go <laughs> yeah no i i totally understand that too i did one fly out trip this year that was eight days and it was only yeah. it was only a week uh but when you're married and you yeah have house and it's it's hard to be gone for that amount of time oh, i've had those offers thrown at me you know like going out to cuba or down to christmas island and stuff like that and i'm like oh my god should have caught me when i was 23 yep <laughs> yeah but it's all good i mean you know uh like i say it's it's awesome just just being back in this place i don't take it for granted for a minute 
you know, the Met House, a great place to be for sure. Yeah. Heck yeah. Well, if, if somebody wants to get a hold of you and fish the Met Tau, what's the best way to get a hold of you? When, when do you start your season again? Are you guiding now or? Uh, yeah. You know, for the, uh, for the hardy folks, they come over and join me for the whitefish season. And, um, yeah, we have some good times, man. Uh, get into a lot of good fish every once in a while. Nice big trout or two as a bycatch doesn't hurt. Um, so yeah, I pretty much will, I'll, I'll guide whenever the river's open. Um, and then I do, uh, fish over here in a few different places. Um, there's one nice private lake that, that, uh, I've been managing a fishery at that I do some, some stuff at there and, uh, got some nice browns and bows there, uh, to pick on in the, uh, still water when, um, when this water is too brown. Um, I pretty much keep it in the Met How though. So, um, yeah, kind of that Memorial day through, um, September, we always close at the end of September, no October here, unfortunately, because of the whole steelhead shortage, but, um, yeah, people can check out, um, the, uh, the podcast that I do, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, radio, uh, fishing report that I've done, uh, for a number of years over here with KTRT, our local radio station. I've just got a, a developed a close relationship with the family. Um, the, the son who, who started the radio station passed away of, uh, leukemia at a young age. He battled with childhood leukemia and he was just sort of this, uh, uh, kid genius, uh, you know, homeschool, uh, kid that, that figured out how to do all the coding and, um, started his own radio station, did all the, um, uh, jumped through all the hoops that it took to start his own radio station. And so, um, I've just always been really close friends with one of his, a couple of his brothers and, and, uh, and the family. And so I kind of made a commitment a long time ago, even before I started guiding, I guess, um, to try to support the family long-term uh, just in that, in Dove's endeavors, uh, because I feel like when things happen, uh, it's almost uh, self-serving to try to just say, you know, what can I do for you now? It's like, well, you know, maybe what can I do for you for, you know, the rest of the time that that person would have maybe, you know, that would have helped that person that's yeah. gone now. So that's kind of always been my thought with the fishing report um, or that's how I started out with it. And uh, so, yeah, we have old backlog fishing reports for, for years on my uh, website, which is uh, flyfishersproshop.com. And uh, I've got some, some articles there about the back country and just some various blog articles that you can read there too. Uh, you can email me at madhowfishingadventures at gmail.com and you can give me a call at 509-429-7298. Um, my schedule fills up pretty fast. Uh, I like to make sure that I keep my, um, my regulars pretty happy. I won't say I have a closed client list. I will make some exceptions, but um, uh, yeah, I'm always happy though to to just try to give people some fish and tips or or point point them in the right direction if I can't get them out there myself. So yeah, give me a call anytime or drop me a line anytime. Awesome. Yeah. Do you cater to any like? Uh, I know you kind of said you don't, but do you do any, if someone was like, hey, I want to go fish a certain lake over there for a certain species of cutthroat or anything? Do you do anything of that sort or? Uh, yeah, you know, depending on what, what the request is, I will, um, get out and do some different stuff. I've had a lot of people ask me about doing like OMAC Lake. Uh, unfortunately I don't do OMAC Lake because it's on the yeah. reservation. Uh, I've, I tried to talk to the, to the Colville tribe about training, uh, some folks and referring to them because I would really be stoked to see, uh somebody or some buddies um get that opportunity over there it's definitely not a uh a super resource or uh employment rich area for the yeah. folks on the reservation there and so it would just be really cool um so i'd love to see that happen but uh unfortunately i've gotten no traction on that one over there so yeah. Anything in the Valley that people want to do. Um, I thought about doing 
backcountry stuff for a while there. You know, I it's sort of a a tough one there because you have to buy hours or you have to you have to put in for hours with the Forest Service. And a lot of the hours here are spoken for by the uh, backcountry uh, horsebackers or out of town uh, fishing guides. Uh, so <laughs> it's kind of interesting. We've got folks from Seattle guiding over here uh, in the backcountry. Um, so that, that's kind of a, a little bit of a bummer sometimes. But you know, I don't I don't know. It's it's tough to tough to get away from the family for, for too, too much time. My boy, Leo never really wants me gone overnight. So yeah. it is what it is, but uh, you know, I, I stay so dang busy with just the river thing anyway, that um, it's just enough to be doing that and then getting my own fishing time in, you know, kind of like you were saying, Keaton, I'm, I'm amazed with um, what I find in some of these uh, little desert creeks uh, to find, you know, some, some big old, gnarly fish in a tiny desert creek that goes from you know 85 degrees in the daytime to to 40 degrees at night thriving there becoming a behemoth is is something i've become infatuated with in the last however many years so i've been out there cruising the scab lands and cool. checking out those creeks out there that's something uh, i like to do kind of through winter sometimes depending on when the everything starts to kind of reactivate as far as uh the aquifer out there yeah yeah so i saw pretty soon i saw something about you and mark doing some of those you know scab creeks out there yeah yeah, yeah. that looks really awesome so yeah what the, that's what i was thinking maybe uh maybe we catch up out there sometime uh absolutely kind of meet in the middle kind of thing yeah that'd be sweet i'm so down and let me know if you make it down to the lower 48 sometime kyle Heck yeah, I, I'm sure I'll be back. You guys make it up here, uh, uh, depending on, on um, uh, you know, just uh, on, on openings, there's a few places sometimes uh, uh, maybe put you up and uh, do some fishing. Yeah, same okay. goes for you over here if you find yourself crawling over this side of the mountain. You know. I got to get over there sometime, come see Taichi and get some sushi over there and yeah. you know, do something in civilized, quote unquote, <laughs> civilized hit, land. Hit it during the uh, summer months and we'll, we'll get yeah. going. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not battling the past right now, man. No, no, it's gnarly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nah. Well, cool. Yeah. Maybe we can catch up sometime in February. That's when I think I'll be heading out uh, and down to the scab lands. Perfect. So, well, great. We, uh, we are coming to a favorite, uh, portion of our, uh, podcast here and it is the rapid fire round. A lot of people like this, um, and it gets, you know, we get to know the little things about you. So Kyle, if you want to kick us off here. Yeah, Leif. So, uh, we just got a few questions to kind of wrap everything up. Uh, first one is what is your favorite fish to catch or to fish for favorite fish to fish for would be any fish in its native environment awesome i like what is your uh dream destination fishery mongolia uh tame lanak everything yeah the whole deal yurts uh borscht i yeah i might even make an exception and take a shot of vodka while i was there <laughs> oh, you got to win in rome yeah. right win in mongolia yeah. especially if i got one of those like freaking hundred whatever pound taming man yeah. That's what's up. yeah yeah that are those golden dorado lately that one's kind of oh. holy cow that looks really freaking cool too oh, yeah, yeah. I just don't, uh, jungle scare me a little bit. I just don't want anything <laughs> crawling up my pee hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. So what is your favorite, um, uh, riverside meal or snack and your favorite drink when you're, when you're out guiding and you're out fishing? Uh, I started pre-prepping well, you know, during COVID lockdown, I took up not bread baking, but ramen making. So I make my oh, own yeah. ramen totally from scratch. And I brought some on the Skagit when I was over there with a couple of buddies and 
that was that's what's up you know you can kind of have your noodles pre-done mm-hmm. your couple toppings <laughs> your ramen eggs all just kind of pre-readied and then just zap it in the jet boil and it's hot and you put it inside yourself that's what's up it's delicious yeah so it's not a cold day yeah nothing beats it and yeah to drink yeah it used to just be a, a uh, beer for sure, like an IPA anymore. I'm I've been hooked on ginger beer, and uh, and doubling down on coffee. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's kind of and you know maybe a you know in the winter a nice fire or in, or in the summertime just kind of kicking it with my toes in the water. Yeah. Nice. All right, you're headed to go fishing or guiding, and you hop in your truck. What is the jams that you're putting on to head to the river? Oh man, that's a tough one. Uh, you know, like if I if if I'm not just listening to the local radio station because I'm big big supporter of the route. Uh, it's my my serious channels. I'm just going to throw out the news one that's that's on number one, because that's just stupid. I don't listen to it anymore. <laughs> if you look at my presets anymore, it's just reggae, comedy, comedy, comedy. Okay. Uh, like I'm I've always been a huge punk rocker. Yeah, but it just makes me drive, pa- uh, drive fast and get aggro. <laughs> so <laughs> I found that I'm better off just listening to some reggae. Something to calm you down. Yeah. Oh man. That's I'm a much awful. nicer person and I'll drive slower. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah, my wife agrees. So um, yeah, that's where I'm at now. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. <clears throat> so you're headed out the door to fish or to guide for the day. What's the first thing that you're grabbing? You can't leave the house without. Oh. Um <laughs> uh probably just my you know my gear bag make sure everything's in it um yeah i won't really talk about everything that's always in my gear bag but i gotta make sure i got my gear bag (laughs) and of course my rod and all that stuff or whatever yeah gotcha yeah what what's um something you wish you knew when you first started guiding Oh, yeah, you you know, like a lot of those things that we just talked about, like how stressful it would be, but how that would be totally balanced with like how rewarding it would be. It just it's just like that it would be a a lot of up and downs. Yeah. yeah, I just that, um, yeah, I guess I just, I knew, I knew it wasn't going to be some kind of walk in the park or just like this, this pipe dream that people make it up to be. But um, I didn't understand just how deep the relationships would be, how much I would care about uh the my clients and and my friends that i that i met through the whole thing um yeah i guess i it it would have been nice to know how uh how important it could be or or how important the relationships could be that you can find doing it that's awesome and that while it's not every it's not you know the the hollywood thing you you think it might be you know some days some days it there's some days like uh, you remember? Did you ever watch that movie Office Space? I don't it's like a that. really, really old one. But uh, the end of the day, you know, they get to beat the crap out of this fax machine that really pissed them off, oh, and they yes. they walk away, and it's like this song is like, "Damn, it feels good to be a gangster," whatever it is. And <laughs> and there's those days that like you feel like that. You feel like, yeah, yeah, that's what's up. Yeah. But then the next day, you get your ass handed to you. Yep. <laughs> and you, you know, or you have like these clients that just, uh, you know, some of the ones that can be toughest are like, you do care that they're not doing well because they're so nice. 
and they're doing everything you say to do. Yes. And it's just not working for them, you know? So it's like, you can go from that super high, high to like almost wanting to punch your own face, you know? Cause it's just like, Oh my God. Or like they're doing everything you tell them to, or the person that like does nothing you tell them to, no matter how many times you tell them to do it. You're like, uh, just, just not so hard. Not so hard. Men, okay. men, men. Not so yeah. You know, or, or they're just slapping another hook into the back of your hand or your ear. And you're like, no, it's, it's cool. It's totally fine. No, no, you're doing fine. You know? <laughs> so yeah there's some of those things that that's yeah it's up and down yeah yeah so this this kind of touches on what you just said a little bit and what we've talked about previous but what's a piece of advice you would give to somebody who's new to fly fishing in general um just you know take that piece or two of advice only work on a piece or two at a time and just add a ton of repetition um, and just get out there and just do it yourself, you know, by yourself or just, you know, with a friend, but like really like only take that. And, and it's kind of the same thing. It's been that way with like martial arts or snowboarding or anything else I've done. Just like, don't, don't overwhelm yourself. Just think about one or two things, only concentrate on that one or two things at a time. And then just move up, move on, you know, build it up or chunk it back down. If you feel like you're getting overwhelmed or things are just falling apart, chunk it back to that first two chunks, build it up one chunk at a time. And, uh, you know, yeah, just, just take it, take it a step or two at a time, but add a lot of repetition because, you know, I, I was only shown, shown how to double haul and strip a fly. I think I learned everything else myself. I was never even taught to just do a single haul. The person I learned from uh, could cast a mile, but it'd been so long since he started, he couldn't help but like double haul. So he's just like, just double haul, screw it, you know? And so like I started with just that and and learned everything else just situationally, you know, uh, was in a tight spot. So I found I needed to steeple up and just roll cast and I figured out how to do that on my own because that's what I need to do that day, you know, or so, you know, ask for help when you need it, but really just uh, keep it simple and just, just do a lot of repetition and pay attention and learn through, uh, through what you're doing. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. We got one last one for you. You Keaton, you want to take it, take it away? Yeah. So we like to end our podcast. Um, we end every podcast with your favorite guide story or fishing moment. Let's hear it. Oh, okay. <laughs> favorite guide story or fishing moment. I think. Uh, you know. Uh, one of my one of my favorite ones really was when I had a a mom or it was a a lady and her daughter, or I mean, her daughter would have been like my age at the time in her, in her late twenties or something or early thirties. I can't remember. Um, And her, the, the lady's husband had passed away and she and her daughter booked a trip with me to go fishing and spread his ashes And, uh, when they described the section of river to me and the area, and we did our best to find what I think was his favorite run and it spread his ashes in it. And it was one of the most amazing things. Like I didn't, I, I had just met these people that day and, you know, a couple hours later, we're standing in the middle of the stream, crying, hugging each other, watching these, this guy's ashes go away in this like surreal, um, bluish white swirl of like mist smoke looking stuff into the, into the river. Um, and yeah, it was just, 
that that's kind of one of those instances where it's like you're you realize that you're doing more than just showing somebody how to catch a fish um yeah or just anytime i'm helping somebody to do it that couldn't usually do it um like if they're getting older or if they have um a disability or anything like that they're just yeah if it's not uh yeah that's probably pretty much my favorite that's really cool that's a great story that's an awesome story to end or kids yeah. taking fish kids fishing when they're behaving <laughs> <laughs> yes that is very cute. yeah well awesome is there uh is there anything else that you might want to add i mean you covered a lot of the great stuff um you gave us a little biology lesson you gave us some about your fishing anything that you missed or you really want people to know or any advice that you think would you know way to just end this podcast yeah, I think we, I mean, I think we covered a lot of it. Just, you know, treat the, treat the resource with respect. Uh, you know, there's more important things than, than likes. Uh, uh, you know, people always talk about chasing clout or hot spotting. you know, social media and the internet has, has not been great in a lot of, ways in society yeah. and so um if we can just find a way to make it uh a positive tool in the way that we use it uh try to be kind to each other uh when you're in a position of experience if you have knowledge to impart uh you know just try to do that with the folks that are courteous enough to ask for it in a way that's respectful. I mean, you don't have to, you're not a trained monkey and your time is your own and, and you don't have to do anything for anyone, but you know, when, when people are respectful and cool and they, they respect your time and, and energy and what you've put into it, you know, yeah. then that, that it feels just fine to help those folks out. And I think if we all approach uh, this endeavor in the right way, both just, um, you know, guiding and fishing in general, it can be a super positive, uh, thing for the resource. Um, it brings a lot more eyes to conservation and a lot more minds into that, com into that conversation about it, uh, where people seem to be less, not so much in the last few years, but overall people have been less in touch with nature in the last, you know, however long. And so it just, anything we can do to keep people, to keep it important uh, to people, because if it's out of sight, it's out of mind and they won't protect it. Um, but overall, you know, the arc of society's thought, I think is in the right direction. You know, people are talking about getting rid of these dams. People are talking about trying to, address uh declines in fish stocks and stuff like this you know we're butting up against population densities of our own but um you know i think people's hearts are in the right places so if we can just um keep doing what we can to be positive role models on the job and and just in life then then it's the best thing we can do and and get the next generation involved because we have to grow uh the the sport or you know or just uh, there again it'll suffer from not enough eyes on the resource and not enough people taking care of it so uh not only make sure we get those people out there that couldn't get themselves out there ordinarily but make sure we through um example pass on that love for for the resource you can't uh, can't just tell them it's important because i said so you know take them out there and didactically teach them how important it is and why awesome yeah i think that's about that's about it and just just try to keep a positive community going with each other yeah absolutely and, yeah. and no one can um love a resource unless they've experienced the resource right and it's kind yeah. of like what you're yeah. getting to do there yeah yeah it's just too damn easy to take it for granted
absolutely. And, mm-hmm. and there's declines and you just got to love it while you still got it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, don't just, it, it can be, it can be tough, but don't walk past a piece of garbage, cram the damn thing in your pocket. If you have to, even if it's not your garbage, because it's just, it's got to stop or it's got to start somewhere. It's, yeah. uh, you know, it just really is up to, to each of us to just kind of set the standard uh, that we want to see out there and, and to be as respectful and good to that, that resource as we can. I mean, it, it, it deserves it. It's done nothing negative to us. So yeah. we really need to pour our energy into trying to do what we can for it. You know, <clears throat> I like what you said there. I, I will go fish in the morning and then in the summertime when it gets hot, I'll use that hot period of the day to go out and clean up trash, you know, there we go, man. get yeah. out as much as you can, fill up a backpack. And then you, you yeah. got that afternoon, you know, yeah. it's, it's easy as that. If you're planning on fishing all day and the water temps get too high, give those fish a break and you're doing something great for the fishery. Totally. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, awesome. Right on you guys. Thanks a lot for having me on. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, thank you. This has been great. I'm sure, I'm sure we could talk for hours, but I'm sure we could too. We'll, we'll, we'll talk again sometime. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Fishing. Heck yeah! All right, you guys. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Leaf. Take care. All right. You too. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Young Guides podcast. Uh, we appreciate Leaf for coming on today, owner and guide of the Met How Fishing Adventures. Um, you can also check out his website, uh, www.flyfisherproshop.com. Um, make sure to go there. He's got, uh, his, like, he, he said it was a podcast or kind of like a radio show, Kyle. Yes. Yep. And it's, it's flyfishersproshop.com. Flyfishersproshop. Yep. Yeah. So. And we'll link that down in the show notes below. So you guys can go to that. Um, I was taking a look at it, uh, while we were talking and he's got a lot of great knowledge on there and links to the the radio show and and the blogs and he's on uh various um social media platforms so you can definitely find him and and learn a lot about about more about leaf himself and then about uh, the guy that he provides you can definitely find him on uh i'm looking at his instagram page right now met how fishing adventures um no space but um if you also want to learn a little more about leaf or get in contact you can go to our website um, and you'll be able to see a little profile about him, how to get in contact with him. And we'll also have that link up there as well. Um, so we appreciate you guys taking the time and listening today. Uh, we are so thankful for you um, to spend the time and listen to our podcast. I think uh, me and Kyle are just amazed by the um, outreach we've had from not only local communities, but from, I mean, what was like, we had people from Vermont and, uh, you know, on the east eastern United States and in different. You said one from where, Kyle? Like Australia, or we've got some. I think we have some in Europe, and then yeah. um, like Australia, New Zealand. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Shout out to the people in the other countries. We appreciate you as well. So, thank you for listening. And uh, this was another episode of the Young Guides Podcast. And uh, Catch you on the next one.